Okay. Thank you. Some sick. Oops. Is it? Okay. Okay. So it's great to uh, uh, be back here. Okay. Yeah. So this this talk is completely unrelated to uh, to yesterday's talk. It is uh, uh, something I've also been working on. Something. Ah. Thank you. Sorry. Got. Thanks. Uh, something I've also been working on in, uh, in the last few years um, in PDE. Right, so um, many uh, equations, uh, many uh, physical systems in PDE are um, governed by differential equations called evolution equations. So evolution equations are differential equations, uh, either uh, ordinary differential equations, only involving one uh, um, variable time, or partial differential equations involving space and time. Which involve yeah so but they, but they evolve in time so they all have to involve time, um, so this is so uh, these are one of the basic uh, equations of motion in uh, in physics. Um, the simplest example maybe of uh, evolution equation is uh, the first order ODE, uh, where uh, so partial t of u time deriv derivative of u is f of u. So u is the unknown solution. Uh, so this might be maybe uh, the location of the tra trajectory of some particle, for instance. So for any given time, in some time interval, let's say from zero to t, um, your particle takes values in some vector space Rm, maybe three dimensions, for instance. Um, and you move around, um, and your velocity is given by some function of your solution. And so f is, is given to you, and then you, you, uh, uh, you evolve. Okay, so th this is a very simple example of, uh, of an evolution equation. Uh, a more realistic example uh, would be this partial differential equation here. Um, it's called the nonlinear wave equation, uh, NOW. So now, uh, the second order in time. So, uh, um, but but u depends on time and space. So u is a function of time uh, and of d spatial variables. For example, d might be three, for instance. So if if you live in three dimensions, uh, also taking values in some vector space. Um, so this might be, for example, some electric field, electromagnetic field, or some other um, some other field. Um, and um, uh, this is a nonlinear wave equation. You take minus the second time derivative of u, uh, plus the spatial Laplacian of u. You take the, the um, double uh, space derivative in every direction, add them up, take the Laplacian, and that will be some function of u. Okay, if this was zero, this would be the linear wave equation. And if you put a nonlinear function of u here, this is the nonlinear wave equation. And so f is some function from um, Rm to Rm. Um, and so this is the nonlinear wave equation. Uh, a slight variant is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, shows up in various uh, quantum mechanical models. Um, so it's, it's very similar, uh, it's just that your solution, um, your field now takes values in the complex numbers to the m, rather than the real numbers to the m. Um, and instead of taking double time derivative, which is what would give you the wave equation, you take i times the first time, deriv time derivative. This will give you the, uh, um, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So, th so th these are several uh, common examples of evolution equations that show up in physics. Um, there's a lot of subtleties as to exactly um, what these equations mean if your solution is rough, it has discontinuities or singularities. Ooh. Um, but uh, okay, but I, I'm not going to care about uh, in this talk about these subtleties. I'm always going to consider smooth solutions and solutions which decay in space, you know, finite energy, these sort of things. Okay. Um, and uh, one of my favorite equations, but also one of the most difficult to deal with, uh, is the, um, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, which describe incompressible fluids, um, uh, or idealized incompressible viscous fluids, uh, such as water. Um, so here, um, it, again, the solution is, a, is uh, this is a system of equations involving an unknown field u, uh, a function of time and space. This is the velocity field. So at any given point uh, in space and time, the, the water has some velocity. That's a vector, and that, that, that's u of, of tx. Um, and then there's also a pressure at any given point. At any given point in time and space, there's, there's the, the, the water pressure. That's a scalar. Um, and then there's these two equations of motion. So um, there's the Navier-Stokes equation. This is a, um, the continuum version of uh, f equals ma, Newton's laws. Uh, so the, um, the acceleration, the, uh, the time derivative of the velocity, uh, differentiated along the velocity field. So you also have to add this transport term here, uh, u dot the gradient of u is equal to um, negative the gradient of the pressure. That's the force coming from the, the water pressure, uh, plus a viscosity um, term, um, nu times the Laplacian of u. That's the effect of, um, of, of the viscosity of water. It dissipates some of the energy. 
So nu is just a positive constant. It, it measures just how viscous uh, your fluid is. And, uh, and then Laplace, uh, delta is just Laplacian. But then uh, you also require that u is incompressible. So u has to be divergence free. Okay, so the, uh, the density of water never changes, uh, in, at least uh, uh, in an idealized setting. And so this system is, is the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, sometimes we consider the case when the viscosity is zero in viscid fluids, um, and then those, those are called the Euler equations when you set nu to zero. Okay, so these are examples of evolution equations um, that show up in um, physics, and we study them uh, mathematically. Um, and um, the natural problem we study, I mean, so there's, there's several questions you can ask about, about these equations, but uh, the natural problem to ask usually is the initial value problem. So what you do is that for, at initial time, time equals zero, you specify what your solution is doing, um, and then you ask, if you know what's going on at time zero, you ask what happens at, at, at later times. So for example, if you have a body of water and you know at, uh, right now where, uh, what the velocity is and pressure is at any given time, at uh, any given point in space, can you then predict what happens you know, um, um, an hour from now, a day from now, uh, what, what happens to the fluid in the future given what happens um, at time zero? So this is the basic initial value problem. Um, now, the initial data you specify at time zero depends a little bit on your equation. Um, so for instance, uh, if you have a first order ODE, like this ODE here, DTU equals F of U, uh, what you do is that you specify just initial position. You just specify what your, your, your particle is doing at time zero, and then that, is, uh, that, that, that tells you what, what happens at later times. Um, if you have the nonlinear wave equation, um, this, this equation here, it uh, turns out you specify, uh, specifying an initial position is not enough. Um, it's, it's not enough to know what uh, your wave. So, so this sort of uh, equation describes, for example, the, um, the evolution of some membrane, like the surface of a drum. Um, well, that, that's not exactly this equation, but you can think of it uh, as uh, similar. Uh, but but it's, it's not just the position um, at initial time, which, which, which is important. You also need to specify in, um, initial velocity. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so for second order equations in time, you need both position and velocity specified in order to to control um, the evolution at later times. Um, but uh, NLS, for instance, is first order, you only need, you need initial position. Okay, so what, what data means is a bit different from, from, from equation to equation. Um, for, the, um, um, Navi, for the fluid equations, Navier-Stokes and, and Euler equations, what you specify is the initial velocity only. So there are two unknowns, velocity and pressure, um, but it turns out that once you are given the velocity, you can actually solve for pressure. You can actually, um, using, if you take the divergence of this equation, you can actually solve for the pressure in terms of velocity. So, uh, you, just, so you don't need to specify initial pressure, you just need to specify initial velocity, um, but it has to be incompressible, it has to be divergence free. Uh, because so, but, so there's a compa compatibility condition that you specify, but other than that, there's really no constraint. Okay. So, um, all right, so people have, so the field of PDE has, uh, has been studying evolution equations and the initial value problem for, for decades. Um, and to, you know, oversimplifying quite a bit, uh, what usually happens for these equations is that if you specify the, the initial data correctly, uh, you usually have local existence. So it's usually not too difficult to uh, establish a local existence result. So um, given any, say, nice smooth solution with uh, uh, in good enough decay, at time zero, given enough, smooth enough data, you can usually solve your equation for a short period of time. There's some short period of time where the fluid is guaranteed to, to, um, to evolve properly without developing any weird singularities or your wave is, is, is not going to blow up on you. Um, but um, what is mo usually more difficult and, and often actually un unknown is the global existence problem, whether you, you can actually solve your equation um, for all time. And uh, sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Um, so this is true even, uh, even with the, the simplest of, uh, of evolution equations. Uh, for example, this first order ODE, uh, <coughs> derivative of u equals f of u. So of course, we, as you learn as, as an, in your undergraduate PDE class, uh, ODE class, um, that, uh, that, that given any um, ODE like this uh, with, a nice, if, with a, some initial data, uh, u naught, and some smooth uh, nonlinearity, there's the existence and uniqueness theorem of Picard, which tells us that, that, that there's always, you can always solve this equation locally, and so there's always some time, which I call T star, for which you can solve, the solution, solve your equation, and you can solve it until some point, and then you stop. Um, now, sometimes T star is infinite, 
uh, which means that you can solve the equation all, all the way um, uh, indefinitely, but sometimes it's finite, so that you, you can solve the equation up to some point, and then at that point, the, uh, the equation can no longer be solved. And, um, and, when, uh, and furthermore, um, if, if, if your equation can only be solved for a finite amount of time, then uh, there must be a good physical reason for doing so, and the good physical reason is that you have blow up. The solution must actually go to infinity. So, um, yeah, so what you can actually prove is that either you have global existence, the time of existence is infinite, or you have finite time of existence and your solution is becoming infinite at that time, um, which is a, uh, which would, uh, uh, so a very, um, so it, it is really physically um, not existing uh, at that, uh, after that time. Okay, so uh, for example, a very simple example, and the, the, the first example everyone learns is, is the Riccati equation, um, derivative, derivative of u equals u squared. Um, so for example, if you specify, um, if you solve this equation um, at, uh, with initial data, uh, u equals one at time zero, you can solve the equation for some time, in fact, for time one, but you blow up at time one because the, uh, uh, this equation has an exact solution. The solution is um, u of t is one over one minus t. Okay, so this makes sense for uh, all times less than one, but as time approaches one, the solution blows up. Okay, so, I mean, well, this is the exact solution, but one way you can think about this Okay, so you can plot u as a function of time. Okay, so, uh, so at time zero, you start at, 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 um, um, at uh, um, u has value one, and so the, the equation is that the, the time derivative, the slope, is supposed to be the square. Okay, so over here, u has slope one. So what you would, what you would expect is that, um, so u is increasing at rate one, so it will, and, and you start at one, so it will, you will soon reach the point two, you know, and the time that you take to, to reach um, the value two should be roughly about one. Uh, it, your, your slope is about one. It's actually a bit less than one, but, but roughly about one. Um, okay, so your doubling time, the time it takes for u to get from one to two is about one. But once u is of, of size two, u squared is, is of size four. And if u, so now the slope is of size four, and um, to double from two to four, if you're, if you're increasing at, at, um, um, at a slope of four, then to increase it by, by two um, at a slope of four, the, uh, the time it should take to do that should be about two over four, so one half. So it, it takes one unit of time to double from here to here, but only a half a unit of time to double from two to four, and until you get from four to eight, okay, now the speed is 16, okay, you should actually, you should only take one quarter of a, of a unit of time to double again. And so what you find with this sort of heuristic analysis is that the doubling times, the, the time it takes for you to get twice as big as it, as, as it was before, converge geometrically. Um, and so, and this is why you have finite time blow up, okay, so that, that uh, that uh, this, this series is convergent, and at, 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 um, at the end, you've doubled an infinite amount of time, and you, you have blown up, okay? So this equation, this solution here, um, does not exist globally because the doubling times are, are converging geometrically to, uh, to, to zero. All right. Um, okay, so in this particular case, uh, you have blow up. Um, but in other cases, uh, you, you don't have blow up. Um, so many equations, uh, many evolution equations, particularly those that, uh, that have physical um, um, meaning, um, have some sort of conservation law that stops uh, this, this sort of blow up, this runaway solu uh, um, solution from happening. So often there's some conservation law, such as an energy conservation law, that, uh, that keeps the energy or some other quantity of, of your solution finite, or bounded, sorry, uh, and then you can't actually go to infinity. So, um, uh, and in particular, if you have some conservation law that traps your solution in some compact set, then, you, uh, then this sort of scenario can't happen. Um, so, um, a simple example is that if you have a particle in a potential well, okay, so uh, you can think of, um, you know, here's space, okay, and you have some potential well, like a, like a hill, and you've got some marble rolling around, uh, around this potential well. Um, so the, the equations of motion for a particle in a potential well are given by, uh, by this equation here, f equals ma. So the, the acceleration here, a dtt of u, is given by um, the negative gradient of the potential energy. Okay, so, th so this, the, this is the equation of motion for a particle in a well. 
Uh, and in this case, uh, there's a conserved energy. The conserved energy is the, uh, is the kinetic energy, um, the half the square of the velocity, or times mass, so that's normalized mass to be one, plus the potential energy. And so this, this, is, the, uh, uh, this, is, uh, um, this is conserved by the flow, energy is conserved, so the kinetic and potential energy can trade places with each other, but the total of energy is always conserved. Um, so as, as long as your potential is defocusing, so um, this potential energy V is said to be defocusing uh, if it goes to infinity at infinity, so it, it goes up like this. Okay. So as long as, as long as V goes to plus infinity at infinity, then um, the energy conservation law um, traps you. So, so if you have a fixed energy, so if the total energy of your particle is, is, of size, is, is E, then, then your, your, um, your particle can never um, escape this region here. It must always be trapped um, inside this, this interval, and then it can't blow up. Oopsie. That's not what I wanted to do. OK. OK, so this is a defocusing nonlinearity. Um, so in contrast, if you have a potential which goes to negative infinity at infinity, so this would be a, de uh, a focusing potential, uh, then, then you can blow up. You know, if you have a marble here, then, um, and if you have um, a potential that, in fact, goes, any potential that goes to zero faster than quadratic, um, um, then, uh, if, um, then the more you go out, the faster you, um, you, know, you, you become uh, because, of, of, uh, because your potential energy becomes more and more negative, uh, and the situation becomes more like this. You can, you can, you can, you can get finite and blow up. If you have a negative potential, let's say minus x to the 4 or something like that. OK. So, um, so for ODEs, at least, the basic story is if you have a conservation law, then, uh, which is defocusing in some sense, then you, have, uh, you tend to have global solutions. Nothing bad happens. But if you, if you don't have this conservation law, or if your conservation law is focusing um, in some sense, then your, your solution can, can blow up. OK, so if you don't have this sort of confining, this, 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 this focusing, so defocusing um, type of potential. OK, so that's the story in ODE. ODEs are relatively well understood. Um, so you can ask the same question uh, for PDEs, if you have an evolution equation of space and time, and you ask, OK, um, all right, so sometimes you have global solutions, sometimes you don't. But if you have a conserved energy, um, uh, and the conserved energy is defocusing in some sense that, 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 that the energy um, surface looks more like this than like this, then, uh, okay, is that good enough to prevent finite time blow up? And uh, what's annoying is that the answer here seems to be really complicated. Uh, it really depends, uh, and we don't understand uh, completely when it happens, when it doesn't happen. Okay, so, um, so just to give you one example, so. Um, so in PDEs, even, when, even, a con even having a conservation law uh, doesn't necessarily stop bad things from happening. Um, so just an explicit example um, is, uh, okay, so, so here is, is an equation called, called the, uh, the, the, uh, the focus in quintic nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Um, okay, so it's an equation of one space and one time um, uh, uh, dimension. Okay, so it, it's I dTU plus half dxxu equals uh, this nonlinear function, uh, minus absolute value of u to the fourth times u. So, so u is a complex valued field. Okay, so this is an evolution equation. Um, it turns out to have a conserved mass. Okay, so um, the mass of, of, this, of this field is, is defined to be the integral of, of the square. Uh, and this, this is conserved for all time. Um, and you know, this is, this is uh, a, a positive quantity. So it, uh, um, in some, it, it traps u in a bounded subset of L2 at least. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this solution, um, th th there are solutions to this equation that are completely smooth at, at, uh, at time zero, but then they become infinite at, uh, at, at, at some finite later time. Um, so there's an exact solution which uh, you shouldn't really stare too hard at. Um, but um, it's easier to explain it, to describe what it looks like, to sketch it. Uh -huh. So the solution, um, okay, so at time zero, it looks like a, uh, it looks kind of like a Gaussian. It's not quite a Gaussian. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's one, one of the co hyperbolic cosine uh, square root. But um, it looks a little bit like a bump like this. Um, and this bump has sort of a width of one and a height of one. 
Okay, so it's, it's, it's a nice, nice uh, bump. Um, but as time evolves, what happens, okay, here's one. Um, as you approach one, uh, like for example, if you're a little bit, if you're just a little bit uh, uh, before the, on the bad time one, um, what happens here actually is that the solution, um, the solution will, 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 will push inwards. It will be supported on a, on a narrower interval of size about two to the minus n. But uh, it will also become steeper. Maybe I'll, okay, it will also become um, a lot taller. Um, so, um, so the closer you get to one, that means that then two to the n, two to the minus n goes to zero. You get narrower and narrower, but you also you also get steeper and steeper. Okay, so your your your, your wave is is focusing um, to a point. It's getting uh, um, and then at at uh, at the final time, it, it has become a sort of this Dirac mass, a little bit like a Dirac delta mass. It it it, uh, it 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 becomes discontinuous over here. Okay, so your solution has, is concentrating all its mass into it into a single point. So at any at any given time, the um, the mass is this 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 m, m of t is always constant, you know. So because the um, the mass is like the the integral of u squared. So if, if u has height two to the minus n over, two to the n over two, you square it. That's like two to the n. You integrate on an interval of size two to the minus n. That's roughly one. So so the mass stays constant, but um, but still you uh, but still you blow up. Okay. Um, one way of thinking about this is is that in it. Um, when you're working in infinite dimensional spaces like L2, uh, the unit ball is no longer compact. So, so just because you're bounded doesn't mean that, 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 uh, that uh, you have compactness anymore. Okay, so that's an ex exact solution. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, uh, I think I just said all this. Okay, yeah, so, so yeah, the solution looks, looks uh, t takes its shape. Okay. Um, Oh, okay. Um, all right. So, um, all right. So now, now let's take a, a slightly different equation. So uh, this is this is the uh, nonlinear wave equation. So uh, minus dt u plus plus the passing u equals um, let's say u to the p minus one times u. And now we have a scalar field takes, takes u values and p is some fixed uh, exponent. This measures of how nonlinear uh, this equation is. Okay. So uh, this equation turns out to have a conserved energy. Um, so much like the particle in a in a well, it's got a it's, it has an energy which, which has a um, a kinetic energy component, a time derivative. Uh, there's a surface tension component, which is coming from the space derivative, and then a potential energy component like this. And the total energy is always conserved. And uh, the basic question is, is that uh, knowing the energy is conserved, is this enough to show that that solutions here uh, um, uh, exist for all time? So uh, can, can you blow up, okay, uh, if you know that the energy is, is, is finite? And um, the answer is, it depends. Um, so it depends on this p exponent p. Uh, so uh, it turns out that, that, that something funny happens if p equals five. So uh, for p less than five, if, if you take this equation for p less than five, let me just write out the equation again. <laughs> turns out that as, as long as p is less than five, then the energy conservation law is strong enough to, um, to give you global solutions. Nothing bad happens. Um, and that's an old result of, of Jorgens from 1961. Um, that's called the subcritical case. Um, and then for the critical case, when p equals five, that was a lot harder. So it took 30 years after Jorgens before uh, we figured out that also for p equals five, the energy conservation law is strong enough to prevent um, uh, a blow up. And so again, th this is a good equation. Um, uh, solutions exist all the time. But then for p bigger than five, we don't know. Uh, this is, this is, uh, uh, okay, it will, it will take more than 30 years, I think, <laughs> to settle this question. Uh, but, okay, yeah, we do, we do not know what, what, what happens for p bigger than 5 uh, for this equation. Um, same thing for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation down here. Again, uh, for p less than 5, uh, we have global solutions for smooth data. Uh, this was done, again, um, as far back as 1985 by Geneva and Velo. Uh, when p equals 5, this was a lot harder. Um, Jean Bourguin was able to prove it in the, in the radio case, and then uh, I managed to prove it in 2008 with four other people, Kaliyanda, Kiyo, Safalani, and Takaoka. Um, and P bigger than five, we don't know. Okay, so, um, right, so, so where, where does five come from? Okay, we're in three dimensions, right? Well, why, why, why five? Um, so, um, okay, so, uh, so there is a heuristic that you can use to explain why some some PDEs are sort of relatively easy to, 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 to deal with, and some PDEs are really quite difficult. 
Ah, oh, okay. Uh, maybe I'll use this equation here. Okay, so yeah, so actually dealing with properly rigorously with function spaces and so forth can be quite technical, but but you can you can get a handle on how these equations work using heuristics. Uh, how can I keep doing this? Okay. All right. So here's your equation. So um, at any given time, you can pretend. Okay. So you, at any given point in space and time, you, your solution should have some amplitude. You know, so it's a, it's a wave. Okay. So waves have amplitude and and frequency. So um, at any given point in time, you uh, you assume that your wave has a certain amplitude. Uh, so it oscillates at some amplitude a, and has some frequency m, uh, which means that its wavelength is like one over n. Okay. So um, let's assume that our solution looks at something like this at, at, some, at some region of space and time. Of course, when you, at different points in space and time, the amplitude may change, frequency may change, but let's, let's say, uh, let's like, ignore that for the time being and just look at amplitude and frequency like this. Okay, so your, if your solution has amplitude A and frequency N, then uh, when you take the Laplacian here, that's two, two, you're differentiating in space twice. So you're dividing by the wavelength twice. So the uh, Laplacian, you would expect to be of size n squared times a. Okay, and then over here, uh, this expression here should be should behave like uh, um, like a to the p. Okay, so that, that if, if a, u is size a, u p minus one times u should have size by a to the p. And so the uh, the heuristic is that it, um, so this equation you can think of as a contest between uh, there are two terms here. So the the solution is being is being pushed. Um, by two different forces. There's, there's the, the linear wave equation dynamics coming from the surface tension, which is trying to sort of dissipate the wave and, and, and push all the oscillation out to infinity. And that's coming from the linear term. Um, and then there's the nonlinear term, which is doing all the bad stuff, you know, focusing your solution together, um, make, making it uh, um, do, potentially do all kinds of unpleasant things. And that's, that's given by the, the nonlinear term. And so depending on which of these expressions is bigger, um, one of these two terms should dominate. So if... Um, yeah, so if the nonlinear size is bigger than the, than the linear size, you should expect, um, uh, you should expect some nonlinear behavior. Which is bad. Okay, but if the nonlinear size is less than the linear size, you should, you should expect linear behavior. This, this is the heuristic. I know how to do it now. Okay. Uh, back. Okay. All right. On the other hand, um, if you're in three dimensions, okay. So in, in three dimensions, if, if you are, have a wavelength of one over n, then uh, you must your solution must spread out. Okay. So um, it could be localized. It could be localized on. To, okay. So your solution, if it has a wavelength of one over n, it could be localized to a single ball, or maybe to a slightly larger region, but. Um, the region that you are localized to must always be at least as big as, as, um, as the ball of radius 1 over n. This is the uncertainty principle from harmonic analysis. So the, the, the size, the volume of your, uh, where your solution lives should be at least like 1 over n cubed. Down here. Okay, this is the uncertainty principle. Okay, this is not rigorous, but, okay, but uh, it's, uh, it's a good heuristic. Okay, so this this um, okay, so you can use this to to understand the energy. So remember, the the conserved energy here has got a um, uh, a, a, t a kinetic energy component, a a, um, um, a surface tension component, and a potential potential energy component. And you know, using these sort of heuristics, you can you can you can start understanding how big this energy is. So, for example, uh, this uh, surface tension component here should so gradient of u is the size n times a. You squared n of a squared. Uh, you've got a volume of n to the minus 3, at least. So the, the amount of surface tension energy should be at least Na squared times n to the minus 3. And then you, you have a similar, um, uh, you, uh, you have a similar um, bound for the potential energy. And so you, you have a lower bound for this energy. So if the energy is bounded, um, energy conservation cons uh, provides a constraint between the amplitude and the, and, the, and the frequency. There is some limit as to how much amplitude you can have for a given frequency. 
So uh, you, you do this computation, and then what you, what you find is, is that this lower bound here, so if your energy is, is bounded, then this quantity must be bounded. There must be some bound connecting um, 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 uh, amplitude and, and frequency. So you have, this, you have this bound here, and then you can just do a little bit of high school algebra, and you find that, that if, uh, if, you have, if amplitude and frequency are constrained by this bound, then you will be necessarily in the nice linear behavior regime um, as long as p is at most 5. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm not going to do the calculation here, but it's, it's just some algebra to get from here to here. And, and you find that when p is less than 5, you, uh, this, uh, you can do this. When p equal to 5, you can just barely get from here to here. And when p is bigger than 5, this condition does not imply this condition here. Okay, so um, that's, that doesn't prove anything, but it does, it does indicate why p equals 5 is important. Okay. And something similar holds for Schrodinger. Okay, so um, one thing this tells you, one thing this suggests, this, this computation suggests, is that um, the, the worst case, the case that's going to be the most nonlinear, is if all the energy of your solution is concentrated at, so at, at, if, if at each time the energy is concentrated in as small a region as, as is predicted by the uncertainty principle. So, so at any given time, the solution may, um, may be supported in just a little ball of size 1 of n cubed, or it could be spread out in a more turbulent fashion in, in a larger, larger space. But, but if it's spread out in a larger region, then the amplitude will be smaller because of, of energy conservation, and then you're more likely to be in the linear regime. So the, the, the most nonlinear case scenario would be if all your energy at any given time is packed into just a, one ball of size of, of, of radius equal to the wavelength. Um, and if your solution can do that, then, uh, and if p is bigger than 5, if you're in the supercritical regime, then um, you would expect, uh, well, then conceivably, uh, blow up can happen. And this is something we, we saw So in, in this explicit example I gave earlier of, of the Quintic NLS. This is exactly what happened. At any given time, the solution is concentrated in as small a region as is permitted by the uncertainty principle. Um, and so th then you actually had blow up. Okay. So, but what we don't know is whether this actually happens. Okay, so, so for p bigger than 5 in the supercritical regime, it is potentially possible to, to have blow up, at least this energy argument, this scaling argument does not prohibit it, but we don't actually uh, have a construction that does this. Okay, so, um, so I started working on, on these sort of questions in the last few years, and um, sort of rather frustratingly, I can't say anything about the actual equations we care about, um, uh, like, like this scalar nonlinear wave equation, but um, I can answer these questions if you allow me, if you allow, um, a cheat, okay, and the cheat, unfortunately, is a big one. You have to change the laws of physics. Um, so the, um, yeah, so for example, for nonlinear wave equations, um, we don't yet know for this equation what happens when p is bigger than five. When p is bigger than five, we, do we have global existence or do we have finite blow up? What happens, we don't know, uh, at least not for the scalar equation. Um, but what I can show uh, is that if p is bigger than five, then I don't know about the scalar equation, but if you take a, um, a vector-valued equation, uh, so u takes value in some, in some r to the m, rather than rn, then there, there is at least one nonlinear wave equation, so with some potential energy. Um, but I, I, I get to pick the, the potential. There, there exists a potential energy such that, uh, which is defocusing, so the, the, the energy is positive, and it, it, keeps the, uh, the energy, it keeps all the terms of the energy are bounded, but, but even though the energy stays bounded, uh, the solution still blows up um, at, um, oh, and, and, and the potential has the, has the right size. It, it, so it behaves like u to the p plus one. Um, but uh, this equation does have solutions which are, which are really nice at time zero, uh, smooth and compactly supported, as, as nice as you can imagine, but they do blow up. Okay, the, the solution does um, concentrate, in fact, to a point and, and blows up. Okay, so, um, so the scalar equation we don't know yet, but, uh, but vector value equations of this type uh, do work uh, as long as m is big enough. Actually, in my proof, m has to be at least 40. <laughs> so uh, as long as you have at least 40 degrees of freedom, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can force blow up. Um, okay, and there's something similar for NLS, which is a bit more technical, but I, I will not mention it here. Okay, so this does, uh, so it's a somewhat artificial equation because I, I'm, I'm, it involves this potential V that, 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 is, that is not natural. It's something that, that I choose to, to, make the, to make the result work. Um, so I would really love to say the same thing for the scalar equation. This is a, but, um, but it doesn't directly say anything about this equation. Um, but what it does do is that it does provide a barrier um, um, to proving. So you know, so 
um, there are many techniques out there for proving global regularity. Um, and one could hope that, that one of these techniques, that if you apply them cleverly enough, that you might be able to, to, to um, show global existence for the scale, scale equation. But, but um, now that we have this, this vector value on the new wave equation for which blow up happens, that tells us that no method can work to prove global regularity for this equation unless they can somehow distinguish the scalar wave equation from the vector value wave equation. And most of the techniques that we know about, if they work for the scalar equation, they also work for the vector value equation. So those techniques are not, cannot possibly solve the scalar equation. You, yeah, yeah. If, you want to solve, if you want to prove global regularity for this equation, you must somehow use some special property of the scalar equation which is not shared by the vector value equation. So um, it, it shows that global existence is going to, if it's true, it's going to be very hard to prove. It's going to need a new technique. In fact, I don't believe global existence is true anymore for these equations. Um, okay, so I want to mention some, uh, so now, okay, um, some of, of the ingredients in, in the proof. Um, all right, so one nice property of this equation is it has finite speaker propagation. Um, that the solutions to this equation, so this is actually a relativistic equation. Um, these solutions cannot propagate faster than speed one. Um, if you put a C squared here, uh, they would not propagate faster than C. But so the speed of light uh, comes in here, but we normalize the speed of light to be one. So solutions cannot propagate faster than the speed of light. So because of this, you can actually just work in, a, in what's called a backwards light cone. You, um, you take time and space, and you take a backwards light cone like this, and you can just specify initial, you, you, um, you can just build a solution only in this light cone. You, 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 if you can find some nice smooth solution um, at, at say time minus one, which just concentrates, which blows up. Okay, so it's nice and smooth here, but it comes more and more infinite uh, as you approach uh, this, this point here. And you don't bother solving the equation outside here. You, you only solve the equation inside this cone. Um, if you can make the solution blow up in this cone, then um, you can extend the solution to, um, to the rest of space. You, you, you just extend your smooth data however you like outside of this, of this region and you, you solve the rest of the equation. But, but because um, the solution only propagates at the speed of light, it doesn't matter what you, um, uh, what you do over here. You won't affect what happens inside this cone. So you can, you can, com you can almost compactify the problem by working only in this, uh, in this cone. This basically compactifies space. It doesn't quite compactify time because of, of this uh, 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 blow up point here. Um, okay, so you start to construct solutions in this, um, uh, in this backwards light cone. Now, there's a standard way to try to construct blow up solutions which blow up at a point like this, which is to construct what's called a self similar solution. Um, so there's a, there's a certain natural notion of, of a self similar solution which, which, which uh, looks like this. Um, so what it means is that the solution at any given time is just a rescaled version of your solution here. So if your solution is doing something over here, it should, it should do the same thing, just scaled. You know, made smaller, but also made taller, okay, and, and it should squash to a point. So you can try just, so a very standard thing to do is to try just constructing um, a self-similar solution for this equation. Uh, but it turns out, unfortunately, uh, such solutions don't exist. Uh, there's, uh, there's a certain integration by parts miracle, which uh, won't, uh, I won't talk about here. Um, but, uh, but you can show that, that such solutions uh, uh, will, will have to have zero energy after lots and lots of integration parts. Um, but what, you could, what, you could, um, what it turns out to be possible to do is you can construct a solution which is what's called discreetly self-similar. So it's not always the same shape, but it keeps returning to the same shape at, at, at a periodic set of times. So at, let's say at, at, at time minus one, it does something, okay, and then it, it changes shape but then at, at, um, at time minus one half, it comes back to the same shape, but rescaled. Okay, so it, 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 it does something. Um, it, it, um, these, these are the solutions that are sometimes called, called breather solutions. They breathe in and breathe out. Okay, so you sort of, uh, breathe out and it breathes in and it comes back to, to, to where it was before, but smaller and, 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 um, and taller. Um, okay, and then it breathes out again and then breathes in again at time minus one quarter. Uh, it will again have this come back to its original shape, but again, we, um, narrower and taller than it was before. And it keeps doing this, uh, and then by, by, by the time you reach time zero, it would, have, um, it would um, now be concentrated on a, on a, on a, on a set of wavelengths of zero and an infinite amplitude, and you, you get blow up. Okay, so the reason why this is um, a good uh, type of solution to consider 
so one way of thinking about it is that you are um, quotienting out. So you have, you have this, this, this cone, this non-compact cone. So you take the cone, you remove the origin. So this is a non-compact region. But you are, you are imposing a symmetry. Uh, and the, the symmetry is um, the dilation group by two. So you, you dilate by two, by four, by eight, by powers of two. Um, and you are, you, are, you are imposing a symmetry of the solution with respect to, to this group. So uh, if I call this cone you know, gamma, what you're really doing is that you are quotienting this cone by, um, by, um, uh, by the symmetry group. And you're really solving now a new PDE on the quotient space. Now the quotient space looks, looks like a, a kind of like a torus. It's, it's um, what it is, it's, the, um, it's a truncated cone. You take the cone from t to the minus one to t to the minus one half. It's a truncated cone. And then you, you take this end here and you glue it to this end over here. You, you, um, you, if you take this end of the cone, you, you squish it down and you, 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 you identify it up here. And so it, it, you get something that looks like a torus. Um, but the, uh, a donut, if you wish. Okay, but the, but the point is it's compact now. You've removed all the, all the, the, uh, the non-compactness for your problem. And so you're now trying to solve a certain PDE on a compact domain. Uh, okay. So, um, all right. So how do you actually solve this equation? So it, it's so weird. Um, so normally in PDEs, what happens is that you're first given the equation. So you, 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 you have to... You, you have your equation of motion, your PDE, uh, and then you solve it, okay, to get your solution u. Okay, so you, you take your, your your PDE, maybe you have some initial data. Yeah, you also have initial data. Okay, and then you, you solve it to get to get your solution u, and then once you have your solution, you can start computing various features of your, your solution, like like energy, momentum, uh, various physical features of of your solution. Uh, it turns out for wave equations. Um, um, most of the, of the physical properties of your solution are, capt uh, are captured by something called the stress energy, stress energy tensor. Okay, which is a, a certain uh, quadratic function uh, of your, of your uh, or plus and nonlinear term. Okay, it, it's a certain combination of derivatives of your solution. Yeah, so um, yeah, it, it, it captures both, both energy and momentum and something called stress. Um, yeah, so for example, T naught naught is the energy density, for instance. Um, yeah, uh, this thing that we saw before, you know, t um, uh, kinetic energy, uh, um, surface tension, and potential energy. Okay, and then, th and then there are other uh, components of the tensor that measure momentum density and so forth. Okay, so this is an important um, statistic of your solution. Okay, and it, it obeys uh, certain um, properties. So energy is conserved and momentum is conserved, uh, and this leads to the stress energy conservation law. It turns out that this tensor, is divergence, divergence free in particular. Okay. And it has some other properties. It's positive, definite, and it has, it has some other, um, some other um, um, properties. Okay, so um, this is a tensor which captures many of the physical features of your solution. Yeah, so, so normally you start your equation, you find your solution, and then you compute things like the stress energy tensor. Um, so to construct blow up, uh, we do everything in reverse. Uh, what we do is that we first write down a stress energy tensor. So we write down a solution. Um, um, we write down a tensor which we believe to capture the energy and momentum currents of, of dynamics of, of, of your of your solution. You first write down a tensor, a stress energy tensor. It has to obey certain conditions like, the, like this conservation law. Starting once you choose your, your once you guess what your tensor is, you then find a solution u that has that that stress energy tensor. So you you have to solve this equation here, where uh, T is the data and U is the unknown. And then once you have, um, yeah, so, okay, so the equation I'm trying to solve is uh, this is the equation here. Okay, so finally, once you have your solution, uh, then you, okay, whatever it is at time one, minus one is your initial data. And once you have a solution, you then find your PDE. Okay, so once you have a solution U, you, you find the, poten the potential for which this equation is true. Um, so, um, so everything, everything goes back in reverse. Um, but, uh, okay, but this is how you can actually construct solutions that blow up. And it's, it's because I need to choose, it's because I, I choose my, my equation last,
that's why I don't get to pick my equation in advance. So it, it, it's, it's unfortunately that's, that's the one catch with this method. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, maybe it's, so some of this is a bit technical. So but maybe I'll, I'll just I'll just mention one cool thing. Um, so getting from the Swiss NG tensor back to the solution U. Yeah. So it's. Um, yeah, so the question is, 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 is given the tensor T alpha beta, can you find a U which solves this equation? All right, so that, that's a relatively complicated um, uh, um, system of, 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 of equations, but it is a variant of a much better studied equation. So uh, there's a much more famous system of equations called the isometric uh, embedding problem, where if you start with a tensor G alpha beta uh, and on some compact manifold M, uh, if, you want to if you want to find some, some field U such that the, uh, the alpha derivative of U in a product of the beta derivative of U is always equal to G alpha beta. So this system of, of, of nonlinear quadratic uh, um, BDE, uh, this is called the isometric embedding problem. So finding such a U is equivalent to finding an isometric embedding of M into U Euclidean space. Uh, and it turns out that this, th th this was famously solved by John Nash in the, in the 50s. So, um, so he proved the Nash embedding theorem that given any smooth compact manifold um, of a certain dimension, if you specify, if you make this dimension M big enough, you can always embed any fixed dimensional manifold into RM isometrically. Um, but the dimensions have to be pretty big. Um, and so th this is why I need, I need 4D dimensions. So actually, so th there's, there's a four dimensional manifold that I need to embed isometrically in, in, into a certain space. Um, and and uh, yeah, so I think Nash needs like 16 or 17 dimensions to, to embed a, four, a 4D manifold. For this more complicated problem, I need 4D. 40 dimensions. But um, yeah, so um, very conveniently for me that you know, this problem was already solved okay, that by this, this Nash embedding theorem. Um, and that, that lets me get from, from here back up to here. Um, getting from the solution U back up to the, uh, the equation V to find V, th th this is actually not too hard. Uh, um, this uses classical analysis, in particular the, the T6 tension theorem is, is the main tool. Um, yeah, so the, um, the, the, the most tricky thing is, is actually to find a good stress energy tensor for which everything else works. Um, um, yeah, so the stress energy tensor has to obey a certain number of conditions, but uh, it turns out that in three dimensions at least, you can make a lot of symmetry assumptions. You, you, you assume that your stress energy tensor is rotation invariant and dilation invariant, and after uh, making a lot of symmetry reductions, the conditions that you need boil down to solving just a whole bunch of, uh, a small number of ODEs. And uh, you can actually just solve the ODs by hand explicitly. And, and you, you can find a stress energy tensor that, that does what you want. Actually, the, what, what happens is that the, the, the energy tensor actually concentrates very near the boundary of this cone. So it, it's, it's like the solution becomes like an imploding shell. It's a shell of energy that implodes to, to a point. OK. All right, so that's, that, that's all I'll say about the, the wave equation. Um, let me just see what I have. Doing the time. Ooh, uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, I, I think I'll skip Euler and just talk about Navier Stokes because, uh, okay. So, um, yeah, so the equation that I most care about, which I, but I can't, uh, I can't resolve, no one can resolve, is the, uh, the Navier Stokes equations. Okay. So we go back to the, uh, uh, okay, so the fluid equation, equations for water. Um, so this is an equation for um, setting fluids um, with both viscosity and pressure. Uh, pressure is a bit annoying, uh, so it turns out that you can you can eliminate pressure from this uh, uh, from this system. Uh, there's a there's a there's a single integral called the the, the ray projection. It's the proje orthogonal projection to divergence-free vector fields. This is a gradient. Gradients are always orthogonal to divergence-free vector fields. So you, if you project uh, to divergence-free vector fields, you can eliminate the pressure, and you get instead uh, you can turn the, the Navier-Stokes equation into a, a nonlinear heat equation. So uh, you can simplify the system to just DTU equals um, viscosity plus U, that would just be the heat equation, plus this annoying um, bilinear nonlinearity, which is this, uh, this somewhat complicated um, bilinear multiplier here. Okay, so um, this, uh, this bilinear multiplier has a certain property. It, uh, there's a certain uh, cancellation. Um, this BUU is always orthogonal to U, as it turns out. So th this you can check by an integ integration by parts. Um, and what that means, it, it's equivalent to energy being conserved, uh, or actually energy being um, um, uh, dissipated. So um, this equation, it doesn't quite conserve energy because of the viscosity. Viscosity will, will drain away 
energy, turn the kinetic energy into heat. Um, but what you find is that the kinetic energy of your, of, of your fluid is always decreasing, okay, and it's always dissipated at, as heat. Um, okay, so, so in, in particular, this, this, this energy is always bounded in time. Um, and in one and two dimensions, that's enough to get global regularity. So, so the Navier-Stokes equation is, is subcritical in 1D and, and critical in 2D, and that's good enough to get global regularity in, 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 in these dimensions. But the dimension we care most about is three dimensions. And in three dimensions, unfortunately, uh, this is a supercritical equation. Um, the energy conservation alt, um, does not prohibit um, the solution from, um, uh, from being in, in the nonlinear regime, where the amplitude is, is so big. Uh, so the amplitude can be so big potentially that the uh, um, nonlinear behavior happens. So uh, we do, uh, it does not seem that the energy density is, is strong enough to, uh, to prevent blow up. Uh, and the big question is, is, uh, is, is, is does the navigation equation actually blow up? Right? There's a million dollar prize for anyone who can prove that or disprove that. Um, so, uh, so I can't do it, no one can, as I said. But um, what I was able to show about two years ago was a similar sort of cheat to before. Um, if you change the laws of physics, then you can answer the question. So um, if you take the, this equation, but you replace the actual um, nonlinearity BUU, which captures the, the physical uh, features of the uh, navier stokes equation by um, what I call an average version of BUU, so something a little bit smaller. So it, it is possible to make the nonlinear the non term a little bit smaller. Um, by averaging it against, uh, with respect to certain symmetries. But uh, let me not talk exactly what averaging means. It's a bit complicated. Um, then the average, there exists an average equation, which is still has good energy properties. It still obeys the energy uh, inequality. So energy is still dissipated. But, um, but now there are solutions which start off smooth and very, very nice, you know, Schwartz class, but, um, but which blow up in finite time, which, which, which concentrate to a point, much like these other solutions here. Uh, they're not quite self-similar, but they're, they're, they're close to self-similar. Yeah, so I wasn't the first to do things like this. There's, a, there's previous work of Montgomery Smith, Shaman, Gallagher, Paiku, and Lee Sinai. Um, but, uh, um, but the previous equations that, that constructions did not have energy conservation. So the, the energy was, was, was blowing up at, together with the solution. But this is, this is um, an example where the energy, stays cons um, the energy is still bounded, but the solution blows up. So what this tells you is that you cannot solve the Navier-Stokes equation regularity problem just using the energy conservation law and standard methods. Uh, you would need to use some technique that distinguishes the true Navier-Stokes equation from this sort of fake Navier-Stokes equation here. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Um, all right. So um, I'll just maybe say a little bit so I'm running out of time. Uh, a little bit about what we do here. So it's, it's, it's a similar sort of, yeah, so I, I, I don't construct these self-similar solutions. In fact, I don't even know if, if they exist um, for Navier-Stokes. Yeah. But the idea, again, is to create something like a discreetly self-similar solution. So a solution which at, at, at a given time has a certain, is localized to a certain region of space and has a certain frequency and a certain amplitude. And then it does something, it breathes, it goes in and out and, and does something. Okay. But after a certain amount of time, it, you, you want it to concentrate into an, an even smaller region of space and with a higher amplitude. And then it, it, will, it will then breathe out and breathe in again, but, but faster now. Okay, so that, that maybe in, in half the time, it will, it will concentrate, it will, it will rescale to a, a smaller version of itself and then do that again and again and again until, un, until you blow up. So um, you can sort of manually ch choose a nonlinearity to sort of push, you, you, you keep trying to push your solution into smaller and smaller scales. Um, but when I, when we, um, and I wasn't the first to, to, to try doing this, but, um, but when, when you do this, um, when you try this in the, in the most naive fashion, uh, you encounter um, a phenomenon known as, as Komogov turbulence. Um, so, you know, when you actually take actual fluids, um, um, fluids don't do this, okay? You know, if, 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 you, if you make a little eddy of water, you know, the water, this eddy of water does not spin into a smaller eddy of water and then spin it into an even smaller eddy of water and so forth. Um, what happens is that the energy spreads out. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe some of the energy will, will move to, 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 to this smaller scale, but then, um, but, um, but then this, but the energy here might, might then, um, while you're, you're trying to squash this energy from, from this scale to this scale, the energy at, um, uh, at, at, at this scale is, is, is itself pushing energy into, into an even smaller scale and so on and so forth. And what will soon happen is that your, 
your your energy um, of your of your fluid will spread out in, in a power spectrum. There will be some portion of energy at low frequencies, some at medium frequencies, some at high frequencies. And once you have enough energy um, spreading out, then um, the amplitude drops to such to, to a point where the the, um, you know, the the linear term dominate dominates again. So you you cannot stay. Uh, it turns out you you don't stay in the, in the nonlinear dom domination regime if uh, um, if the energy can spread out. And so uh, the hard part of this of, of this work was that we, um, I had to somehow program um, this nonlinearity. I, I, I choose this nonlinearity to prevent the the Kolmogorov turbulence uh, effect from happening. So what I had to do was was um, I had to keep the solution localized at 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 at, at, at one region of space, uh, one one frequency, and it, you keep it there for a certain period of time, and and then you very suddenly squash it to a, the next higher. Uh, so the solution sort of s spins around very slowly. At a um, at a certain frequency, and then it, it suddenly collapses to something of half the size. Um, but then you, 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 have to make, you have to make a stop again. You have, you have to, so it 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 it, it, it um, you, you you then have to sort of put a, a, a delay in your equation. So it it, it um, you have to wait for all this all the energy from from the previous mode to 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 to, to drain into, into your new mode before you start the next phase of the cycle. Uh, if, if 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 you if you if you have all these sort of energy transfer modes going on simultaneously, you get this you get this turbulence effect. So you have to sort of program your your your, um, uh, your e equation almost like a, like um, making a, a circuit actually, um, like designing a circuit. And so my, my, my actually I, I got this idea from my wife actually, who was trained as an electrical engineer, and um, you know so you know engineering is some of the opposite of of, uh, uh, of mathematics in some sense. You know, so so you know uh, in mathematical PD you're given the equation and, and you start solving it. You know, but engineering you you have a desired um, outcome, a solution, and you want to design, you know, your circuit, just design your equation that will produce the, the, the given output. So it, it's, it's sort of the, the opposite mentality. Um, so um, yeah, and engineers design circuits, you know, out of simpler objects, you know, like maybe capacitors and resistors and so forth. And you you, you take these simple objects and you put them together. And so um, I had to to make to to make these these. Um, um, so I, I I built this this nonlinearity, which is rather complicated, out of s smaller, simpler uh, nonlinearities that that. Who's, which, which behave kind of like uh, actually like logic gates and in all gates, um, and um, and I had to program a, a simple clock so that uh, you, you know, um, so that, uh, that that your solution on, only moves from one frequency to another after a certain time delay. Um, but anyway, uh, it is possible to do this uh, uh, after quite a lot of work, uh, and so you can create a, a, a rather weird uh, equation which 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 behaves like Navier-Stokes and blows up. Um, yeah. So I, as I said, what, what this tells you is that um, this rules out. So many uh, of the existing techniques uh, to to prove global regularity will not work to solve Navier-Stokes because they cannot distinguish the, the Navier-Stokes equation from this artificial average Navier-Stokes equation, which does have finite hand blow up. So if you want to solve the global regularity problem for Navier-Stokes, which I don't believe is, is 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 true actually, but if you want to do it, you must use some property of Navier-Stokes which is not um, true for this average equation. Now there are such things. Okay, so you know, this this result doesn't doesn't exclude every single possible way to to, to prove uh, regularity for, for Navier-Stokes. Um, for example, um, you can take the, the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation, and there's an extra equation which is very important for Navier-Stokes, uh, which um, which is uh, uh, something called the, the vorticity equation. So there's something called the, the vorticity, uh, which is the curl of the velocity field, it measures sort of how much your 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 um, your fluid spins, and this obeys a, 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 an additional equation uh, in Navier-Stokes. But, but this average Navier-Stokes equation does not obey an equation of this form. Um, so one possible uh, loophole uh, here is that if you want to prove uh, global regularity for Navier-Stokes, you would somehow need to use this equation. Now, I, I do believe that there is some modification of, of my construction. There should be some way to construct an average Navier-Stokes equation that, that also obeys the Bautista equation and which has finite time blow up, which would, which would close this loophole. Um, I can't do that for Navier-Stokes. Um, I can do it for the Euler equations, but um, I think uh, in the interest of time, I will not discuss that, those results. Um, and I think I'll just uh, yeah, skip all that. And uh, yeah, finish. Okay. Thank you.